So I was thinking the other day when I was walking around about Taylor polynomials and you know how you can approximate a smooth function by some polynomial of degree k or like say, say it's smooth of degree k so it's k times continuously differentiable then Taylor's theorem tells us that there's a Taylor polynomial of degree k and then there's this remainder term which we can add to it and I've known about this theorem for many years now. You learn it in first year undergraduate, more or less. And you learn about complex, you learn about power series and complex analysis and all these types of things. And I was thinking, I don't actually know the proof of Taylor's theorem. I don't ever remember being exposed to it. And I was under the assumption, you know, it must be quite difficult to prove then. And as I was walking, I figured, you know, it's, it's probably just the fundamental theorem of calculus applied many times and as I continue walking I notice that yeah it is just the fundamental theorem of calculus many times and it's it's absurd in many senses why we don't get taught this proof and so today's video is all about working through this proof and it's ex and it's a proof that you could discover as soon as you know the fundamental theorem of calculus and maybe you're bored going for a walk on a Thursday afternoon so let's get into it so let's recall that one of the most powerful consequences of calculus is that it allows us to approximate functions by infinite series of the form the sum from k equals zero to infinity of some coefficient ck times x to the minus a to the power of k. So that is we can approximate functions, in this case analytic functions, by Taylor series. We learn in undergraduate that functions like sine x and cosine x, they can be written in the following way. They can be written at the, as these infinite series. And we even learn how to do this for arbitrary smooth functions. Maybe not the sum from k equals zero to infinity. Maybe we have to sum to a finite number and then have this remainder term. For example, Taylor's theorem tells us that for a function f, which is k times continuously differentiable. We can write f of x as the sum from j equals 0 to k of cj times x to the minus a to the jth power plus some remainder term which is dependent on k. Now it's very common for many of us to never see the proof of this result. And if we do, the proof is either convoluted and unenlightening at best. In this video, we'll look at a very elementary proof that can easily be gotten by anyone with a free afternoon as soon as they know the fundamental theorem of calculus. So recall that the fundamental theorem of calculus says that for a smooth function f, let's say defined on the closed interval a to b into r, there is a smooth function capital F on the same interval into r such that the integral from a to b of small f of x is equal to big F of B minus big F of A. Moreover, big F prime of X is equal to small F of X. In other words, we have an antiderivative. That's what the fundamental theorem of calculus says. Now rearranging this expression, we can write that F of B is equal to F of A plus the integral from A to B of F prime of X dx. And of course, we can vary b or a as much as we like. And to emphasize this, what we'll do is we'll replace b with t to emphasize the fact that it's not fixed, that t is a variable here, or b is a variable here. Now, if we suppose the function is smooth, namely we can differentiate it any number of times, an infinite number of times in fact, then we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to f prime this time. And so what we get is that f prime of x is f prime of a plus the integral from a to x of the second derivative of f and we need to introduce another variable t1. So we'll have the integral from a to x of f double prime of t1 dt1. Now inserting this back into our original equation here we see that the integral from a to t of f prime of x dx is the integral from a to t of f prime of a dx plus the integral from a to t followed by the integral from a to x of f double prime of t1 dt1 dx 
Now, f prime of a, that's just a constant. You've evaluated the derivative of f at a point, and that's a number. So by standard rules of integration, we can pull that out of the integral. And so we're left with f prime of a times the integral from a to t of dx plus what we had before. But the integral from a to t of dx, well, that's just t minus a. And so what we can do is we can now simplify the starting expression. And so we can write f of t is f of a plus f prime of a times t minus a plus the integral from a to t of the integral from a to x of f double prime of t1 dt1 dx. Now with this expression for f, we'll now apply the fundamental theorem of calculus as we did before, before we did it with f prime, this time we'll do it with f double prime. So this time we'll find that f double prime of t1 is f double prime of a plus the integral from a to t1 of the third derivative of f and to introduce a new variable, we'll have t2 this time. So we'll have the integral from a to t1 of the third derivative of f at t2, dt2. So in the original expression now, we have the integral from a to t of the integral of a to x of f double prime t1 dt1 dx. And so we now have to integrate the second derivative. So we'll have the integral from a to t of the integral from a to x of f double prime of t1 dt1 dx being f double prime of a. We'll have f double prime of a times the integral from a to t of x minus a dx plus the integral from a to t of the integral of a to x of the integral of a to t1 of f of, of the third derivative of f at t2 dt2 dt1 dx. Now this looks complicated but all that we've done is, is done the same thing as we did before but to f double prime instead of f prime. Now this first expression on the right hand side we just need to integrate x minus a with respect to x in which case we get one half t minus a squared and we can insert this into the primary expression, in which case we get f of t is equal to f of a plus f prime of a, t minus a plus f double prime of a, one half t minus a all squared, plus this integral term here. So applying the fundamental theorem of calculus to the third derivative of f at t2, we have the following expression, which then simplifies to this expression here, now that we have the third derivative of f at a times one-sixth of t minus a all cubed, plus this worsening integral expression here. We'll do the same thing applying the fundamental theorem of calculus to the fourth derivative of f at the variable t3. In this case we'll have an additional term with the fourth derivative of f evaluated at a plus 1 over 4 factorial times t minus a to the 4. And then we have an even worse integral expression. But this is again just gotten from the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now we can iterate this procedure as many times as the function will allow. So if our function is k times continuously differentiable, we can do this k times. In which case we find that f of t is equal to f of a plus the sum from j equals 1 to k of 1 over j factorial times the jth derivative of f evaluated at a times t minus a to the j. And then we'll have this horrendous looking remainder term here. And we'll just call that rk plus 1, or in the original notation rk. And that's it. That's the proof of Taylor's theorem there, given merely by the fundamental theorem of calculus, arguably the simplest proof you could give of this theorem and of one of the most important theorems in calculus. I never remember being shown this proof, which is disappointing considering how elementary it is and how important Taylor's theorem is. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you've made it this far and haven't already subscribed, 
please subscribe that really supports the channel and allows me to continue making these videos and spend more time making these videos if you feel this is valuable and would like to share it with other people feel free to do so okay guys bye for now